and welcome to a special edition of KQED Newsroom, Cannabis at a Crossroads. I'm Tui Vu. On this program, we'll take an in-depth look at marijuana in the Golden State. In November 2016, California voters passed Proposition 64, legalizing cannabis for recreational use. Starting in 2018, adults 21 and over will be able to carry and consume an ounce of pot recreationally. They can also grow up to six plants at home. But first, state officials must craft new rules for regulating and licensing an already billion-dollar industry that's expected to get much bigger. We visited the second oldest dispensary in California to see how they're preparing for the changes. KQED Shara Sadiq has more. So I take it this is where you keep all your inventory? Yeah, this is where we display all our top shelf green tag specials and edibles for our bud bar. How many vendors are you buying products from? We have over a thousand vendors. We see hundreds of patients every day. Um, do you have any sativas on special? Or? Yeah. In 2018, the legalization of marijuana will go into full effect in California, so anyone 21 and over can walk into a dispensary and buy pot recreationally. How is that going to impact your business? It's going to impact us a lot. It's going to increase our patient database, um, probably double, I would say. How much do you go for? And that means that the demand is higher, and we're going to have to start providing more products for those patients as well. So how are you going to respond to that increased demand? Will you just simply buy more products from your vendors? We ho hope that it'll be that easy, um, but because of the new state regulations, we can only buy after 2018 from state-permitted cultivators. We may go from seeing thousands of vendors every day to seeing five vendors. They won't be able to receive a permit either because they don't meet the regulations that are being put into place or they don't have the finances to actually apply for the state permit or the state um, just may lag on actually approving those permits, meaning that only a couple maybe get through. And then those would be the only cultivators that we would be able to actually purchase from at that time. So you're saying that the green door, that your dispensary may actually run out of marijuana? We could absolutely run out of marijuana, uh, just like Colorado and Nevada did. Um, when they went recreational, they didn't have enough quantity on hand from the cultivators to vent to the dispensaries. And we're very worried that that same thing is going to happen here. The state is regulating the cannabis industry and requiring people to have business licenses, in part because they want to crack down on the black market for cannabis. Isn't that a good thing? It's a great thing, but the regulations are so strict and cost a lot of money and time to get those state applications that it causes a lot of mom and pop cultivators that are currently doing business in California to be pushed out of getting a permit, therefore not being able to sell their products to the dispensaries, which, you know, floods the black market. It seems crazy to think that California, with all of the tens of thousands of pot growers, could actually run out of pot run out of legitimate pot <laughs> that's uh, licensed the way that they want it regulated. It's a very um, fearful thing that could absolutely happen. What do you got for me? Today I brought you in a pound of presidential purple. At the green door, I also spoke with cannabis supplier Robert Toll. Perfect. Earlier this year, Toll grew marijuana in Nevada, which faced shortages when recreational pot became legal there in July. What was that experience like? What did you see over there? Um, it was exciting. It was a wave they weren't ready for. Uh, they went from having only a small amount of patients that could actually purchase medical marijuana to having anyone who flew into Nevada who was 21 and up could now buy weed if they were a recreational user. They weren't ready for it. The supply ran out for the social or recreational user, but not for the medical side. Are you going to be applying for a state business license to continue to cultivate cannabis? Yes, we are. We are formally right now in the process of doing that in Sacramento. How are patients, or even people who want to use it recreationally, how are they going to get their hands on pot? Uh, they're going to do it the old-fashioned way. They're going to go to the streets. They're going to go to the people who know people and, and do it the, the bad way, where we're not getting taxation on it, where we're not you know, giving the money that we need to make sure things go the way they should. CO2 oil? California is about to regulate this billion-dollar industry that you've been a part of for some time. What do you like about those efforts, and what don't you like? I love the fact that it's going to be legal. Have a good one, love. I love the fact that I'm going to be able to open a facility and, and do what I want and pay my taxes like I want. It's a great thing, but there's going to be paperwork. It's going to be a battle. It's an uphill battle that a lot of people might not make. And joining me now with further analysis are San Francisco Chronicle Cannabis Editor David Downs, Attorney Allison Malsbury, whose practice focuses on the cannabis industry, and Christian Grow, co-founder and partner at the private equity firm Privateer Holdings. So, David, we just heard from a retailer. Uh, they're worried about having enough supply. So if you've got a situation here where you have 
both recreational and medical marijuana users competing for a limited supply. Does one group get priority over the other? It's not exactly clear. The market's going to be extremely turbulent for, I'd say, anywhere from six to 18 months after legalization kicks in 2018. Very few stores are going to be open for recreational sales. We're also seeing that plenty of the supplies of cannabis are going to fail testing. Prices are going to go up and before they go down, and selection's going to go down before it goes up. So that's a lot going on in just 16 months or so. Very much so. And this follows uh, the tracks that other states before us have gone through, whether it's Nevada, uh, Colorado or Washington, they've all gone through these growing pains and it's been quite uncomfortable for a number of them. I would add though that with legalization we've seen a number of cities and counties begin to allow medical dispensaries for the first time in 21 years in this state. I'm counting at least two dozen cities and counties that are going to allow safe access in their towns. So that's already begun to be a boon for patients. And Allison, we have a situation where there are three state agencies uh, that will be responsible for issuing nearly 20 different types of business licenses for cannabis related activities right. from everything from cultivation to testing to retail. Mm -hmm. So what areas are you fielding the most inquiries about in your law practice? You know, I'm really feeling inquiries across the board from people who are looking into all different kinds of licenses. Obviously, we have a lot of cultivators already operating in the state, dispensaries um, and manufacturers, but some of the new license types like distributors, um, I'm getting a lot of inquiries about distribution licenses, what that's going to look like, um, and delivery as well um, is, a, is a license that people are, are very curious about. And Christian, you've been at this for about seven years now, okay. uh, once this started being legalized in other states. And um, you invest in the cannabis industry, not only here in California, but also in Canada and Washington State. As far as encouraging innovation and protecting consumers, what do you think the main challenges will be for California right now? I think the main challenges are banking and the regulatory framework, meaning we've seen uh, jurisdictions launch either medicinal or adult use uh, regulatory environments, and they've failed or on the verge of failing. Uh, California has the most cultural significance on the planet and it's the sixth largest economy in, in the world. So it has to be treated almost like a country as opposed to a state. But if the regulators uh, are able to get that piece of the regulatory environment right, it allows uh, entrepreneurs and, and startup companies to, to flourish and, and bring in new products and brands and form factors into this space. And how tough is that challenge to strike that balance because you want to have regulation but not so much regulation that it becomes a huge barrier for people to become legal, if you will. That's right. It's a fine line. You have to work with the, the taxation piece of it. You don't want it too high because it will uh, allow the black market to undercut the, the, the regulated market. But you don't want to be too laissez-faire because you'll see uh, people take advantage of the whole environment. So it's really important to strike that appropriate balance. And David, this is a huge task for state officials, right? They've got to essentially design, build, and operate a brand new regulatory system. Will they be ready come January 1st? You know, we hear uh, from the main regulator, Lori Ajax, that it's full speed ahead over there. They're staffing up, hiring dozens of people. They have tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in loans from the state government to make this happen. And from what we're hearing, they're gonna be ready to begin issuing at least one emergency temporary license to one licensee on January 2nd, 2018. But what people need to know is that this is gonna start out small in urban areas on the coast and it's gonna expand very slowly out from there. You're seeing most cities and counties, which play as big of a role as the state in terms of regulations, ban most cannabis activity. And this mirrors other states as well. So maybe 80 to 90% of cities and counties in California will have bans on things like pot shops or pot farms. So uh, I think a lot of California voters are gonna be surprised when they have to drive 100 miles to find the nearest open recreational store, at least for the foreseeable future. So Allison, within the legal sphere then, how difficult does this become for you for your job? Because now you've got this patchwork quilt of you know, state law versus county law versus city law. And I take it that state rules will not supersede any of the local jurisdictions. Well, you have to keep in mind both state and local regulations, right? They're gonna be working together. So we have cities and counties, local jurisdictions that are regulating things completely differently all, all over the board. Um, but ultimately we have state law on top of all of that. So um, business owners need to be mindful not only of complying with state law, but also local law. Um, 
in fact, in order to get a state license, you have to comply with local law. It's very important. So um, from my perspective, it's made my job really difficult, um, not just because of the patchwork of regulations across the state, but because the regulations are constantly changing and quite frankly, because we don't even have the final regulations yet. We don't even know what the final rules are going to be um, that govern these licensees. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult for my clients to make big business decisions um, when they don't even know what the rules are going to look like. Stay here with me because we're going to go now to Humboldt County because it was the first county in California to create a permit system to allow medical marijuana to be grown openly for profit. Here's a look at what they've experienced. Nearly 300 miles north of San Francisco, thick redwoods stretch to the sky. In this land of giants, the buzz of sawmills and the splash of fishing nets were once the sounds of a booming economy. Today, there's another industry that's thriving here and driving up demand for goods and services. And your total will be $3,023.99 after tax. From leaf trimming machines to water storage services and specialty soils, marijuana is big business in Humboldt County. Humboldt County is the Napa of cannabis. It is by far and away the largest production zone of high quality cannabis in the world. And for the first time in nearly 50 years, it's coming out of the shadows. I believe that instead of complaining about the smell of cannabis, the people of Humboldt County will realize that that's the smell of cultivating local prosperity. Patrick Murphy is the co-owner of Emerald Family Farms, a collective of cannabis farmers. We would like to create an industry that is both environmentally and economically sustainable. Humboldt County now wants all pot farmers like Murphy to register and obtain a permit to grow medical cannabis for profit. Size limits apply depending on how the crop is grown and whether it's new or existing cultivation. The limit for new cultivation is 10,000 square feet or about a quarter of an acre. Existing operations we've allowed all the way up to one acre in size if they can meet requirements. Steve Lazar is a senior planner at the Planning and Building Department in Eureka. He helped write the county's new rules just as a green rush has been taking off in the forested hills of Humboldt. So here we're looking at a photograph from 2006. The photograph shows a forested area, but by 2015, this area is now host to 20 to 30 different cultivation operations. So here we can see evidence of greenhouse construction, water storage. One could easily estimate that there is over 10,000 cultivation sites in the county at this point. Good morning. Hi, how are you doing today? Fantastic. Glad the old to back's hear it. hurting a little bit today. Oh, for two decades, yeah. cannabis was legal to use in California for medical purposes. It's got a great look, got a great smell. Patients could also grow pot and supply it to dispensaries as long as they didn't profit from it. Then, in November 2016, California voters also legalized the drug for recreational use. State officials are now scrambling to regulate both medical and recreational marijuana by creating new regulations and licenses starting in 2018. Now we can call a spade a spade. Profit is part of being a farmer, whether you're growing cannabis or tomatoes. Maybe so, but it's still illegal at the federal level to grow or sell cannabis. Every cannabis cultivator lives in fear of law enforcement, having their children taken away from them, having financial ruin. By the end of 2016, more than 2,000 pot farmers, including Murphy, came forward to register for a local permit to cultivate medical cannabis. Still, Humboldt's former sheriff says only a fraction of the county's pot ends up in the hands of patients. I'd say 95% of the marijuana growing in Humboldt County, and possibly higher, is actually going to the black market. It's going to sit on the table. Using permits to control where and how marijuana can be grown may not stop the black market, but it may help law enforcement target the massive and illegal growing operations that feed it. What we have here is evidence that has been found in a marijuana grow that's been seized by the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office. These right here are processed marijuana in one pound bags. And we have typical firearms that are seized in a marijuana grow. AK-47 assault weapons, M-14 rifles. This is what they use to protect their marijuana. The new land use ordinance does help us in determining the good actors from the bad actors. In 2018, California will require all cannabis to be tracked through the supply chain to help keep it out of the black market.
Humboldt County launched its own pilot track and trace program in 2016. The program used traceable stamps to follow bags of processed pot from cultivation to distribution at 100 dispensaries across the state. The culture and business of cannabis is changing throughout California. As this iconic plant turns into a scalable commodity, local and state policies may determine whether it thrives or withers. I believe that it'll be grown all over the West Coast, and I believe the price per pound is gonna become so low that the industry is gonna be driven out of Humboldt County. The fear is that the people that were a part of this, that started this movement, will not have a place in the future. And it will only happen if we do not take part, if we do not stand up and make our voices heard as the heart and soul of the cannabis industry. All right, let's return now to our panel and talk a little more about the market dynamics of cannabis in California. So Christian, we just saw what's happening in Humboldt County. Small and medium-sized growers in Humboldt and, and elsewhere in the state have expressed concern that um, they may be put out of business or have their industry dominated by a handful of really big, powerful players. How real a possibility is that? Uh, it's real. Uh, we, we hope that the, the, the economics and the, the framework allow for small to medium sized growers to thrive. Um, you know, it's for a consumer or a patient, um, uh, most of those users are really interested in, in small batch grows that you can mostly find up in the North County areas of California. But we are seeing uh, different jurisdictions activate large scale greenhouse grows down on the Central Coast in Southern California. So there could be a scenario where uh, the small uh, cultivators up in Humboldt County that have been doing it for decades could uh, be eliminated by some of the bigger facilities. What about big tobacco or, or big pharma even moving into this? I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think uh, the federal prohibition has to end before you see you know, big pharma, big alcohol, big, big tobacco, big retail enter mm -hmm. the space, but they're definitely looking at it and it's clearly on their radar. And, and, you know, your fund, you've raised $140 million, um, and, and some of it came from tech companies. How big are tech players uh, in this space right now? We're starting to see a number of uh, major tech companies who are swallowing up more and more of traditional businesses begin to touch deliberately or accidentally cannabis businesses as well. So, for example, Microsoft is powering data services in terms of Rhode Island's track and trace system. Amazon is one of the world's biggest head shops now. Instagram is certainly where all the cannabis culture does to do goes to do its marketing. And Christian, do you have tech investors in your fund? We do. Uh, Founders Fund, Peter Thiel's uh, fund, made the first institutional investment uh, in our Series B round, which was uh, a couple of years ago. But we saw that as, uh, as essentially Pandora's box, and now we're seeing uh, a lot of the venture firms on on Sand Hill and beyond make uh, active investments, not not all, all directly into the space, but a lot of the ancillary businesses as well. So for example, Joe Montana, or he's not a tech guy, but his uh, well, one no, of the funds he, wor he works with just put a, made another investment in a cannabis media mm -hmm. company and a number of early Facebook uh, employees at a, comp at, a, at a firm called Slow Ventures also um, put, I think, like five million in a, in a media company related to cannabis. A mm -hmm. good number of my clients are coming from the tech industry as well, whether they're looking to invest with money they've made in the tech industry or whether they're looking to develop um, you know, apps or things like that for the cannabis industry specifically. And they're chasing <laughs> yield and they love picks and shovels plays, and the cannabis industry needs one of everything that tr the traditional industry needs. And, and, and I, I do want to touch on this as well, though. Um, and, you know, one of the arguments for legalizing marijuana is that it will help curb the black market. And, Allison, I'm mm -hmm. curious, what ha you were based in Seattle for a while. So based on your experience, what have you seen in other states, such as Washington or Colorado, where pot has been legal for a while now? Sure. I mean, there's always a transition period, right? There's going to be a period of time where there are people who are operating in compliance with state law and there are bad actors who are surviving. But as you know, the, the regulatory system um, is implemented and the state gets better at, at figuring out what's going on, um, they're getting better at eradicating the bad actors. So we in Washington have definitely seen a decline in, in the black market. Um, I think that, you know, uh, sort of along those same lines, uh, the argument that, uh, that, that legalization is going to lead to increased access, um, you know, to cannabis by children, things like that, um, just hasn't shown to be true. Um, you know, really, regulation, um, it, it's a good thing, right? Putting restrictions on who can access, um, it, it has helped to undermine the black market. It has helped to keep cannabis out of the hands of people who shouldn't have it. 
one thing I think that's missing is that none of these states exist in an economic vacuum, okay? So California is the number one domestic producer of cannabis for the entire country. Mm -hmm. So even after we legalize it and eight other states and DC has, there's still 42 states where it's illegal and there's still plenty of people in those states that demand cannabis and they get it from us and other places like Colorado and the West Coast. This preceded legalization and it's gonna continue afterwards. Our, a lot of our black market pots going to um, Illinois, Chicago, mm -hmm. New York, Atlanta. Yeah. And you know, I, we have research that says California's market's a $24 billion pot market. Only one billion is in the legal medical system. Three billion is in the illegal recreational market in California. That's 20 billion that's going out of state. And how long it continues to do that is gonna depend on what happens with the rest of the well, country. Well, but California is trying to launch a track and trace system. So how is that coming along? It's coming along really well. Track and trace is a sort of solved issue in society. Yeah. The, the company that's doing the track and trace system is carrying, is, has had a lot of business doing tobacco taxes and tobacco track right. and trace. Mm -hmm. So we have that down and we can keep tracked, traced cannabis in the legal market. It's just a matter of resources to go after the people growing in garages, growing in forests to supply markets far outside of the state. And Christian, we only have about 30 seconds remaining, but I wanna make sure we touch on this. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has compared uh, cannabis to heroin. How big is the fear that the federal government will come in and crack down and pull the rug out from under you? Until uh, federal prohibition ends, it's, it's always a fear. Um, you know, I think there was uh, uh, a lot of anxiety, you know, post November election, but that seems to have subsided a little bit. Um, I, I think there, you're starting to see more responsible uh, cannabis entrepreneurs and businesses step up. And, and take their message to Washington and at the local and state level um, just to make it clear that this is not uh, black market cannabis we're dealing with. We're dealing with a regulated environment. All right, we will have to leave it there. Thank you to Allison Malsberry, a cannabis attorney based here in San Francisco. Also, Christian Grow with Privateer Holdings and David Downs, San Francisco Chronicles cannabis editor. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Tweet. All right, let's look now at one entrepreneur's efforts to carve out a niche in the marijuana business. Cody Strauss gives us rare access to his company, which faces challenges that abound in this changing industry. In Humboldt County, Cody Strauss drives to a weathered wooden barn to check up on his crops. Behind the barn's faded red doors lies a high-tech climate-controlled room where tidy rows of marijuana plants ripen for harvest. Strauss is the CEO of Northern Emeralds, a company that has been producing medical cannabis in Humboldt since 2015. I created Northern Emeralds because one of the biggest problems in the cannabis industry is having consistency in product. And that's one of the hardest things to do as a farmer, especially a cannabis farmer. A keen eye and a nose for details must also be developed when catering to connoisseurs. It's got a good nose. It's a really good quality smell. I think it's a little bit suffocated because the room was, was run a little bit hot. I'm thinking we're looking at a gold, lower end of the gold. Strauss and his colleagues grade the buds on a 100-point scale. Just three grams of a platinum-grade batch can sell for $70 at a marijuana dispensary. The nose tells you everything up front. It's the first tool that we use. We can tell whether something was cured improperly. This is a great opportunity for us to bridge the gap and all the details that are really uncharted territory in cannabis. Wines had a long history, coffee's had a long history, and right now it's a new beginning for cannabis. But making Humboldt County the Napa Valley of top shelf cannabis takes a leap of faith. The drug is still illegal at the federal level to grow or sell. What keeps me up at night right now is the unknown. It's a gamble to be involved in an industry that's not quite set yet. It's dangerous. You know somebody that's been busted. You know somebody who's livelihoods have been taken away from them. In February 2016, Humboldt became the first California county to create a system of permits to allow medical pot growers to openly profit from their plants. Strauss holds four permits to grow up to 30,000 square feet of cannabis. We went through the hassle of applying these permits because we want to be professionals. We are compliant and legal, and it's our goal to really open up to the world in a way that's safe and having a permits the first step in that. It could also be the first step in ending a green rush of people staking out the forested hills of Humboldt to cash in on cannabis, which can sell for thousands of dollars a pound. Five, six years ago, we had 1,000, 2,000 grows within the county. Now, the number has gone up to about 12,000. 
To fight the environmental impact of this booming industry, Humboldt's new rules require growers to get additional permits to legally take water from rivers and streams. The county also requires indoor growers like Northern Emeralds to minimize their carbon footprint. We source all of our power from renewable sources. We capture up to 85% of all the water that we feed our plants in the rooms and reuse it for the following feeding. There's a lot of challenges that I face as the owner of a cannabis business. One is having a little bit of prejudice against us to start with. Every step along the way, there's a premium for services rendered to us. Everything from payroll costs, taxes, insurance, workman's comp, what we can and cannot write off. People would think that we're, you know, just raking in the dough, and it's really not that way. Inside one of Northern Emerald's climate-controlled grow rooms, lights spur the cannabis to flower and produce buds brimming with THC. That's the main chemical in marijuana that generates a high. After nearly 12 weeks, the plants are ready for harvest and then cured for up to a month to remove moisture. The trimming team can now get to work, spending six hours a day to meticulously manicure the buds. So they'll look for mold, mildew, and cut it out or discard the bud if necessary. After it's been trimmed, I get to see it a second time and I'll sort it into three or four categories based on size, structure, color, and potency. 70 dispensaries throughout California sell Northern Emeralds products. Since it's still illegal at the federal level, earnings from cannabis can't be deposited into federally insured banks. So counting stacks of cash is an essential and risky part of the job. So there's a lot of safety measures that we have to put in that are very costly, very risky when you're handling in large quantities of cash. 5,000 out here. That requires strategy and care and trust. The legalization of cannabis in California sparks new challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs eager to now turn these fields of green into a legitimate commodity they can more safely and openly bet on. It's a very exciting time to be in the cannabis industry. Cannabis is exiting prohibition, just like the alcohol industry. It tastes pretty good. Yeah. It's a relief that we have the opportunity to come out of the shadows. It's a lot more work, but it's a big relief, and I think the people that are going to do it are going to be really happy with the results. That does it for us. You can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.